you look outside today, who's ready to plant corn in about 75 days? <laughs> who's thinking about planting corn in 75 days? Um, Mark asked me to do this talk about a month ago, and he's asked me to share everything that uh, Precision Planning's up to and kind of go through some different planner maintenance stuff. So I pulled up that PowerPoint we got from Precision. It was 275 slides long. So we might be here a while. But uh, luckily I was able to trim it down and uh, get, uh, we're going to kind of give you a mile overhead overview of what Precision Planning's up to. Uh, we got uh, six new products we released in the last two years. I'm going to briefly hit on those. And my main objective is just to kind of keep you guys as minds going about uh, getting that planner out, starting to work on it, and go through a few things to get it uh, functioning well. Bob did a good job earlier talking about the uh, factory that you're planting in the ground. Every seed is a factory. You're asking that seed to produce itself two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred times over again. And we got to do everything we can to protect that factory and get it off to a great start. <clears throat> we also, another big thing Precision Plan has been talking about lately is um, increased populations, increased uh, more ears per acre. And I really like to get guys thinking about how are you going to push your populations to 40, 50,000, even 40,000, 30 inch rows, how are you going to manage that? How are we going to make enough room in that row? Um, do we got to look at going to twin rows? Do we got to look at going to 20 inch rows? Do we have to go looking at 15 inch rows? What are we going to do to give those plants a little bit more room? We know if we stack in 45,000 years per acre and 30 inch rows, we're looking at four inches apart. And it's not enough room for that plant. So going forward to feed the world in the future, what are we going to do? Are we going to stay at 30s? Are we going to go out in 20s? We've got to start thinking about the planners of the future and how they're going to look as well. What we want is duplication. Every time we put a seed in the ground, every time we make a pass, we want to produce that perfect deer. We want to create an environment that allows us to do so. So carbon copy is the key. Every time we raise that planter, every time we set it down, we want to do the same thing time and time again. <coughs> Excuse me. What we don't want <laughs> is each guessing. You know, am I doing what's right? Should I be out here? Should I not be out here? Is my planter working right? We need to know when we're going to the field and we're putting those seeds in the ground. When we come back, a few days later, we want every seed to emerge within 24 hours to 36 hours. What happens if it doesn't emerge? What happens if it emerges 36 hours late? It's a weed. It's gone. So we want to make sure that every time we do it, it's carbon copy, and we're doing the same thing every time. <clears throat> Many of you guys have uh, had us on your farm with our test stand. We've. Um, been traveling West Michigan now with the test stand for about four or five years, running about 12 to 1300 meters a year throughout West Michigan. So it's the basics, it's the start. You got to know where your meters are performing and how they're how they're performing, and uh, before you get to the field. Why is simulation so important? We know that when we can simulate seeds better, we get better yield. The better we can simulate those seeds, the further they are apart, the less consistent they are, stacking up on top of each other higher yield potential we have. Industry standard is going away from finger pickups. It's hard to get a plan with finger pickup finger pickups anymore. Deer has kind of said that they're going to stop producing the finger in the next couple years. Kenzie's not far behind. Um, industry standard is we're getting better results out of a vacuum planner. Every time we're seeing two to two and a half bushel increase by just going from a finger to a vacuum planner. The latest meter precision planning came out with is kind of a launching pad for the next few years is the V-Set. The V-Set is a small compact vacuum meter that's designed to transfer a finger planter into a vacuum planter. So basically they're taking out the finger and the blower to it and putting um, <coughs> this little compact meter right in the spot. We're able to plant corn and beans as of right now. Um, we're working on many other specialty crops as well with this meter. This meter is also the catalyst to their electric drives and a few other things we've got coming out in the future as well that you'll see later on. 
live fingers, we're live, live vacuuming with fingers. This is a simulation map of a planter that was split half and half. Basically, one half of the 16 row planter was set up to V sets, one half to fingers. If you notice there up on the top, it's a hybrid switch. Farmers switch different hybrids. The finger could not respond to those needs. Simulation dropped four or five points. From what we've seen earlier, four or five simulation points probably cost them 10, 12 bushel on that hybrid. <coughs> Same thing here through the field. You can see we're able to hold that population very consistently with the finger struggling with different speeds and um, different ground conditions. The scary thing about this meter, the faster you go, the better it works. We're not talking four miles an hour or five miles an hour. We're talking seven, eight, nine miles an hour. This meter on the test stand will run better at nine and a half miles an hour than it will at four and a half miles an hour. So, can kind of gives you the general direction of what way the planning manufacturers and everybody's going. <clears throat> for the guys who have vacuum planners currently, they have an ESET system that's been around for five, six years. Basically a conversion over from the John Deere vacuum system to a um, precision vacuum system. They used higher vacuum pressure and a five lobe simulator to manage the seed drop. We can do everything you can, we can do our meters and make them run perfect coming out of the shed. But if you guys don't do your parts and we set the planters up right, we're just setting ourselves up for failure. One of the biggest things we see is draw bar, or we're not running that seven by seven bar in a parallel level condition. When you set the planter down on the ground, we want that planter frame along with the parallel arms and the seed boxes to be completely level as close as we can. Typically, you're going to be about 20 to 22 inches off the ground level. Uh, maintaining that levelness is a key to success for our fertilizer, our no-till cultures, and everything else in line to help maintain proper seeding depth. You want that in, in the ground or on top of the ground like that? Typically, I'd like to see it in the ground. He's set up in a gravel driveway there. I'd like to see him pull it out in the field, drop it in, and level that pitch up that way. Typically, what most guys are going to do is take the draw bar, pull it out, flip it around, so that it then goes up. Or if you got three point now, most planters, five planters now are on the three point hitch. And it's just a matter of getting it set with the draft tube. <coughs> Next thing we want you to do is, uh, when your planter up in the air, go behind that thing and grab a hold of the roll unit and start shaking that thing. If there's any movement in there beyond just a fraction of a tilt, we got to start looking at all of our bolts and our parallel, parallel linkage arms. If there's any slop in there, we're not going to be able to maintain straightness and hold that roll unit straight to where we need to be. Replace those bolts, replace those bushings, get rid of them as well as looking at all the sprockets and the chains. No, what's left of them? What's left of them. You guys laugh. There is planters out there running like this today. I see them all the time. Usually they call me when their corn's about a foot tall and say, you redid my meters, but I didn't have any money. No money left to do anything else. So I skipped everything else, he said. They're paying the price. Chains. I see these all the time. The best way to maintain your chains, when you're done planting, take a bolt cutter, cut those things. Right in the middle. It's the best way to keep your chains, because you know what you do with them, next year you're going to buy new ones. Every year, replace all your chains. You'll save yourself a lot of trees. <coughs> Seat opener disc. Brand new ones are 15 inches. When they're down to 14 and a half, get rid of them. Don't call me and say they're 14 and 5 eighths and I got a thousand acres to plant. I think I can make it through the year. <laughs> Get rid of them. We want to make sure we maintain that true V trench all the way through the season. When you do put new ones on, make sure you put the slide the business card in there from either end. Make, make a mark on the disc. Try to get between two and two and a half inches between those marks. While you have the seed disc openers off, check that seed tube protector, that loop that comes down. 
you got any wear on that side, go ahead and replace that while you're at it, because more than likely your seed tube is going to look like that, and you're going to be having trouble with that uh, with seed bounce coming off that seed, that seed tube. <coughs> Gauge wheels. You want to make sure those are adjusted right, and just when you, when you turn them, you want them to be able to pull that seed opener disc along with it just a little bit. We don't want to be sticking our fingers in there. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up soil, throw it in the bottom of the trench, and, cause, and uh, cause, cause a false seed bed and have irregular planting nymphs. I carry a high opinion on no-till cultures. And it's this, and it's my opinion, take it for its worth. But you remember the discount tire commercial where the old lady used to roll it up, throw it to the front window of the store, and they said, if you're ever completely unsatisfied with any product, feel free to take it back. I feel anybody should be able to do that with no-till holders to their local dealer, whoever they bought their planter from. They're very dangerous. They're very, they serve a purpose very well, but they can be very dangerous and detrimental to your planting operation. Typically, guys are not running them far enough above their seed trench. And what we're doing is creating a false bottom. So we're actually planting seeds deeper than we want to. <coughs> Manufacturers say they should be a quarter inch above the true V openers. Now, if you've got your planter bar tilted one way or another, especially if it's planted tilted forward, we're going to be digging in. We could be digging, I've seen them dig a half inch to three quarters of an inch below where the seed actually is. The other dangerous thing in, is on low CEC soils. I had a grower call me this fall, totally unsatisfied with what his plant performance was. So we got a train wreck out here. It was corn on corn, low CEC soils. It says my stalk size is anywhere from a thumb size to a pinky size to an inch and a half diameter. He says I could not figure out what I got going on. I made it about 20 feet in the field. And the first two stalks I see next to each other on the desk over there. And that no-till coulter was just causing, was not moving residue out of the way. We were planting in heavy residue time and time again. Every time we dug up two stalks next to each other, the one root ball was full of last year's corn crop for the residue. Work with a lot of peer no-tillers down in the Marcellus area, guys who have been no-tilling 25, 30 years, consistent no-till. One of the biggest like, questions I like to ask is, what's the biggest mistake you ever made in your farm life? Because guys, you know, five, six years later, they'll start telling me about it. They won't tell you about it the next year. But he says, I've been a no-tailer for 20 years now. Five years ago, I seen the light and I took my no-till filters off. Left them on half my planter for a year to make sure I was on the right track. But when we took them off, six bushel increase. He said he was seeing so much hair pitting in the stalks, he, um, was, he decided to take them off. It's, uh, like I said, they're good in the back. Um, if you pair them up with a nice road cleaner in the front, I got no problem running them because they let the road cleaner do the work. But just be very careful with those and the adjustments. <coughs> Once again, we'll take the backwards. Prison planting also sells your 2020 monitor. Um, everybody pretty much knows about it now. The basic functions <coughs> we can do is control variable rate populations, control air force. We can do side dress rates. We're now in the combine, as well as the planter monitor. So we've come a long way in the last few years in making it more of a utility monitor. Five basic components: monitor, GPS. We've got rums for measuring or helping push the data through and downforce sensors to measure downforce which we'll talk about a little bit later on and a smart connector to uh, process the data for you. <coughs> Seed firmers, one of my basic things and most important thing every planter should have. Um, seen this time and time again, I look at ind all independent non-precision planning studies and I do look at them. If you guys are not running seed firmers, it's the best way to gain one harvestable year for every thousand seeds planted. Actually, every 17 and a half feet, so one thousandth of an acre, excuse me. And if you can do that, you're going to gain five to six bushel by running seed firmers. 
And what we're doing is trying to promote proper seed to soil contact. Anytime we can get that proper seed to soil contact, we're going to get that seed to soak up moisture, get the nutrients on the top up, the river has with it, to get going. What we want to do is that's also going to help promote even emergence, which is going to help us down the line for not um, <coughs> uh, for helping with uh, even emergence and profitability and har more harvestable years per acre. One thing we've got to be concerned about is the environment we're uh, creating with our planters. When I talk about environment we're creating with the planters, I'm talking about the space underneath the gauge wheels. We want to make sure when our planter goes through, we're leaving an environment that promotes root growth, not stunting it and creating hatchet roots. We want to make sure that we leave the lightest footprint we can going through that field because we don't want to damage any of our sidewalls and cause hatching and allow our roots not to get down with our fertilizers. 2020 Air Force came out four or five years ago. We found it was a great tool in managing your down pressure, changing the whole planter um, as it's going through the field. Um, it's been a great tool. We've seen usually a five to seven bushel increase, yield increase on field averages of running the 2020, the 2020 Air Force system. It's adaptable to uh, CNH, Kenzie's, Deers, Monsoons, any kind of planters you want out there. One thing we learned though with having the Air Force system is it does a good job of, of uh, changing the whole planter. It does not adjust well for frame weight. When I start talking about frame weight, we start looking at a nice evenly distributed planter like this where it's consistent all the way across the bar where that weight is spread. But what the fact of the matter is, in today's planters, we're seeing more and more big central fill planters, where guys are throwing 90 to 100 units of seed in them. They're putting five to 600 gallons of starter fertilizers on that tongue. And what we're doing is creating an environment that is extremely compacted. This is not a, a little bit hard to see here. But basically, if you can see from here, we've got one, two, three, four rows in that center section. You can see this time and time again. If you look at, if you know what kind of planters your customer has, and if he's, or if your neighbors have, and you're going around, and you look for that center section, you'll see those four rows anytime. Unless they're planting in a perfectly blow sand environment, you can pick out those four rows every time. What we see is, this is uh, individual ear ears taken from those four rows. So as you get further out, our yields increase, and what we're doing is um, creating an environment that's very hard for that root system, for that row unit to get the seed to proper planting depth, and because it's got dealing with so much compaction in the center. So you can see those are the yields taken from each respectable row underneath that section. Average rows, four rows with no tires, 247 bushel. The four rows in the center, we're seeing about a 63 bushel loss and a 21 bushel average per acre when you go out and do the math by having those um, big center fill planters. So strongly encourage guys, I know it's more of work, but to have this each individual, bo each individual boxes, um, we feel that it does a lot better job of managing that weight distribution. New product that Precision Planning came up with this year is uh, help to design to uh, combat that problem. It's called Delta Force. Basically, what it is is uh, we went from planner wide control with Air Force to pictures not showing up. But anyway, we went from farming by the field, so to speak, to the Air Force, where we would be. In the old times where we would set the springs with the airbags, where we would set one pressure, and now we're farming by the foot. We have the ability to change, oh, there it comes. We have the ability to change downforce three times per second. And we can go from adding 50 pounds of weight in the gauge wheels to 350 pounds of gauge wheels to taking all that weight off within one second with hydraulic cylinders while going five mile an hour. 
field. Faster and more precise adjustments in its row by row. It's no longer a planter wide average. Each individual row is working on its own. You're basically at that point running a 16 row individual planter, 16 whatever many rows you have. Each row is thinking for itself and acting differently. Why is that important? On the far side, what you see is a couple maps. And each map represents, it's hard to see, but each row represents a row on that planner. Wherever we see red, with red lines, we're looking at over 250 pounds of excess weight in the gauge wheels. Wherever we're seeing blue, means that row unit came up out of the ground and the gauge wheels were no longer touching the ground. With Delta Force, we're able to control that individually. You can see on the far, far right there, we're able to minimize that and carry the correct amount of margin left over weight in the, guard, the gauge wheels to help prevent sidewall compaction or shallow planting. Did, they did some testing out um, down in Illinois on the system. What they did is they, they took a nice field and they had a sprayer operator come in and make two passes on an angle. Just, just drove through there to see what would happen. We went through with the planter, and if you look, right through here, those blue spots match up perfectly. So when you're going through that field, our system was able to find those spray tracks and realize we're taking 200 readings per second. That as we went through those 12 inch wide sprayer tracks, our rolling came off the ground and we were shallow planting in that area. <clears throat> so how that looks is you got a hydraulic system going to each row uh, with a hydraulic cylinder that acts and thinks on its own. It's got a, a wave pin down in the gauge wheels. If you guys are familiar with the 2020 system and where those goes, each row has its own wave pin. And it's working within the brain box right here to make those decisions of when to lower when to raise. And like I said, it's reading 200 readings per second has the ability to change three times per second. Row cleaners, we talked a lot about going to no-till and stuff like that. Row cleaners, I believe, is the foundation to success for every planner. Me and Bob were talking about this earlier in one of the meetings, but um, we're seeing corn stalks that are a lot harder to decay. You know, we're seeing, we're fighting with trash that's not just one year old, but two years old. Even planting into soybeans, stubble, we're still dealing with corn trash in a couple years ago that we need to get out of the way of that row unit. <clears throat> we're asking our row cleaners to do a lot of things. Um, we're asking them to move a lot of trash, so we need a we need a good quality roll cleaner and a floating roll cleaner is what we recommend nine out of ten circumstances. We took we do deal with fixed roll cleaners. We'd rather see you put a floating roll cleaner on there. It has the ability to adjust to the contours of the ground and cruise along that surface. With a rigid or a fixed, you're basically fighting the hills and the tops and the valleys. Sometimes you're working, sometimes you're not. We can perform well in no-till conditions. We can clear paths, um, enough for the gauge wheels, and dump ourselves in. We have the ability of a roll cleaner to clean a clean path, move all the trash out from a no-till in a wheat stubble, rye burn downs, we've seen it, where they're doing cereal rye. In the end, we're creating a nice environment. This is some of the hair painting. This is a picture of a hair painting that I was talking about earlier with the no-till coulter, just running, leaving it in the furrow, not moving that trash up in the way. We want to lift and pull that trash out. Another one that's happening there, you can see that seed, the stalk is sucking up the nutrients and the moisture, not allowing that corn plant to get a good healthy start. You can see what happens when that plant comes up, it's competing two, three days behind the weed. <clears throat> what we want to do is be able to move two, three hundred bushel yield trash out of the way, create a clean path. 
clean environment, lift and pull all that trash out of there, throw it to the center of the room. Even with the floating roll cleaners, we've noticed that they bounce too much, hard to keep in proper adjustment. Precision came out with a product called Clean Sweep a couple years ago, where we're mounting an air cylinder on there now, and we're allowed. That gives us the ability to put enough down force on the roll cleaner where you cannot lift it up in the nose. It takes uh, two, we had two guys lifting up on one before, two guys could not budge it up. But it also has the flexibility of lifting it six inches off the ground. So if you get into rocky conditions and you don't want to wreck your roll cleaners, you're able to lift that right up and pull it off the ground. How it works is a nice little handy controller up in the top corner of your cab. Basically, you just push it from lift to down. You can create how much ever down pressure or lift pressure you want on that roll cleaner. Um, typically, once you push the lever within 10 seconds, it's lifted up or down to where you want it to be. On average, um, this is a BETS study. Floating roll cleaners with a clean sweep they did was seen about a 10 bushel per acre better. And they would manage that roll cleaner even better yet. Get this question many times a year. What do we do with closing wheels? My biggest thing is make sure they're aligned. Um, there's a million different choices out there, but um, the first thing, the most important thing I tell you guys to do is make sure it's aligned well. Drop it in on a piece of concrete, pull ahead 10 feet, check those scrapes, make sure we're, our seat opener disc are running in the center there. Precision did a study on pretty much any kind of roll cleaning or excuse me, closing wheel system out of the market today. Because they got the question a million times, we got a question a million times as dealers. They attested, they tested aggressive spike closing wheels. Aggressive would be a aggressive would be a spike closing wheel with a rubber, you name it. And they said, okay, they put it all the way out there, you know, perfectly ideal drive that and they see what effect the closing wheel system had on your final ear count, basically. And as you can see, pick your poison. It's not much difference between any of them. I would say if you're no-tailing and you want to get out there a couple days earlier, you better think about a spike. Because the main thing I'm concerned about is we do not leave that seed trench like that. We want to make sure you leave the seed trench like that. We want to make sure you leave it. So when you're done in there, it looks like you weren't even in there. So you got to pick your poison, kind of. Um, if you are going to play around with different closing wheels, be prepared to change them as the season goes. A lot of guys will start out with spikes on their closing wheel system at the beginning of the year. By halfway through, when things start drying up, they'll stop, put rubber closing wheels back on, and finish off the year. <clears throat> New product Precision came out with this year that ties in with the V set, was the V drive. With the V-Drive, we now have the ability to do variable rate and clutching in the same unit. We're using a 12-volt electric motor to run the V-Set meter. If you guys noticed on those pictures earlier, it had a cod disc. This motor hooks right in there and drives that. We have the ability to change populations up to 20,000 seeds accurately within 12 inches. So going in and out of pivots, in and out of population zones, it can change from 24,000 to 44,000, maintain proper spacing, and have that commanded and done within 12 inches. It also has the ability, it's got um, accelerometers mounted on that planter bar when you're planting. So if you're planting around a curve like you see there, it has the ability, the first outside curve is when the accelerometer is turned off. You can see there, we went from planting 34,000 on the inside to 26,5 on the outside. It has the ability to do a turn compensation, so if you're planting on a curve, it'll automatically adjust each motor going to the field. On a 16 roll planter, you'll be able to plant four different populations at once going across the field if you so desire. That's how it looks on the bottom of the meter. Right now, it's available for John Deere planters, um, John Deere central fills, so the mini hoppers, 
or it retrofits into any John Deere planter. Um, Kinsey's with the finger planters ahead of time at this time do not have the right we're struggling with clearance on central fill planters on Kinsey's with getting the motor in and stuff like that, doing some retweaking. But they're also on C and H and monosoons as well. <laughs> some quick benefits, curved compensation, clutch and motor, one compact design. Another nice thing about it is we can now eliminate all hydraulic drives, all chains, all sprockets, any problem wearable bearing areas that we had in the planter. We're no longer relying on ground transmissions or hydraulic transmissions to do the work. We can eliminate all those moving parts off the plant. This map here shows the normal hydraulic planter against the electric planter for changing populations and the, uh, the command and populations as you can see the lines here through the zones are quite broken and it takes that planter roughly 20 to 30 feet to make that population change with the v-drive you can pick out those zones clear as a bell lay them on top of your prescription boundaries and the lines match up perfectly Picture might be a little bit hard to see, but does anybody see anything different in that cornfield? A couple of them. <laughs> What's that? A couple, a couple of checkerboards. Yep. Precision planning released this two weeks ago <coughs> at their winter conference. It's the first meter available that can plant two hybrids at once. Um, Basically what it does is it's got a baffle in it, and as it's going through the field, it's going to shut one baffle, open up another. So it's going to allow you to have two different hybrids in your planter at once. Unfortunately, we don't know as much about this as dealers yet as I would like. They just released it at Winter Conference. They haven't told us the logistics and how they're going to do that and seed delivery and everything yet. But um, this will be running, I thought they said, on. Um, 15 planners throughout the U.S. this year, and they're a beta test year. So, really, there'll be a beta test this year. Next year will be a very limited release. So, we're staring down 2016 before a lot of this technology is there. Thanks for some real creative corn mazes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Another thing they released at Winter Conference last week, two weeks ago, was a product they called Speed Tube. I told you the scary thing about the V-set meter earlier is the faster you plant, the better that meter plants. The problem we had up until the Speed Tube is our seed dropped down the seed tube. What they did is they redesigned the seed tube, basically. Let's get a better picture here. Got a belt system in it, so as soon as it drops out of the meter, it's going to drop into a belt system down the seed tube, and it's going to release the seed about an inch or two off the top of the dirt to handle all those spacing issues we're going to see. Um, industry standard, industries, if you start reading through magazines and stuff like that, everybody's talking about high speed corn planters. Which I think is really neat, but I don't think there's too many corn planters that are going to handle our conditions around here planting at 9 and 10 miles an hour. I think most of you guys tried to plant at 9 and 10 miles an hour and you'd have two or three corn planters by the time you did two or three rounds. Um, so what they're working on, they want you to do two hybrids at once. They want you to be able to go as fast as you can to be as most productive as you can. Another thing Precision came out with this year is off the corn planter, but they've made the 2020 more versatile and they moved to combines this year for the first time. What they did is took the, took the yield monitor basics from Egg Leader, John Deere, everybody else out there who has one, and tried to redesign it. What they found with the old system is under low, full, low flow conditions, so soybeans, you know, 
130 to 200 bushel corn, or 150 bushel corn, excuse me. What we had with the current system was when it threw against their reed sensing paddle, when you had low full conditions, it was like throwing marbles. So it was beating off there really hard. And basically what that was doing is making an over report your low yields. And then when we were in high yield conditions, 200 plus bushel corn, it was like throwing <coughs> mothballs at each other because it was under-reporting because a lot of that corn could not get to that sensor to get an accurate reading. So what Precision did is two things. The first thing they did was help everybody else's meters become more accurate. We replaced the, the paddle in there. It's basically a bunch of tires cut up. So we put a poly paddle in there that's cupped and curved, and every one of the paddles is the same shape and design. Or if you look at your clean grain elevator now, the old tire system, they're all just a little bit different. So what, what they did is they needed a consistent throw. Every time that went around, they wanted a consistent paddle, so it threw the same no matter how much grain was into it. So they first of all, they changed the paddle. Then we changed the location of where we're measuring the grain. We moved it to the top back part of the clean grain elevator. And what they're doing there is using a Halifax sensor to measure G-forces, and they know how many, when it's rating so many G-forces, we're using so much grain going over the system. The nice thing about the system is it's a one and done calibration type deal. You just go out and you pick 25,000 pounds of beans, it's calibrated for the year. You go pick 25,000 pounds of corn, and it's calibrated for the year. Um, and they're seeing, at the end of the year, less than a 1% um, accuracy rate efficiency from scale weights by just calibrating once. So you don't have to calibrate different moistures, different speeds, different volumes going through the machine. It obviously uses the 2020 and the iPad for that. One of the nice things about this system is we did some testing this year. Um, Green Valley did it on their own. We had some growers out there with this system. And through the iPads and the cloud system, which good or bad is likewise, it's to be debated, but we were able to take the farmer's field hour after he got done harvesting. Within an hour, he had his yield maps to us. We were able to take those yield maps overlay them with other historical yields and his soil fertility records through GPS grid sample. <coughs> and an hour later, we had a variable rate potash recommendation back to him that he was able to spread on that field. He never hit, all he had to do was hit the sync button with our data guy, and an hour later, we had a variable rate potash map back to him and spread on that field. So you no longer have to get that data off the monitor, transfer it on your computer, down to the whoever's going to handle your data and move the data all around. So that was pretty neat. Too. That's all done through field view, through precision planning. Basically, what they're doing now is taking iPads, hook them to your 2020s, you're making maps, live streaming as you go. Whatever you're seeing on your 2020 monitor, as far as population, singulation, spacing, hybrid tracking, Seven seconds after you went over that spot, it's creating the map that's with you all the time in your iPad. <clears throat> Here's a simulation map. It has the ability. You can see here every difference. It's hard to see, but there's lines going north, south, east, west. Every one represents a row of the corn planter, and every line going up represents a second in time. So if we threw a, a skip, it's a, it'll show up as a red seed in there. So if you're really diehard and your kids are bored, you can give them the iPad and kind of go find a skip and drop some seeds in the ground. Same thing with spacing. Anytime you got a display or a misplaced seed, you'll do the same thing. That's our 100 mile an hour, two mile overview of what precision planning is up to. We got a lot of stuff on the pipe work. Um, hope I got you guys thinking about corn planting, even though it's a bad day. The technology is evolving faster than what we can mostly keep up with. 
but they got some very exciting products. Um, best place to start is make sure your meters are running and proper tuned, and making sure your bushings, your drive chains, your sprockets, and all that stuff is available. Um, v drives and Delta Forces are sold out for the year. Um, the dealers are all fighting with each other and trading different products around. And I got a dealer friend down in Louisiana that they start planting here in a month and he's trying to sell a system yet. If he can't sell it, he's going to sell it to me because I got it sold up here. And the dealers are network is going fast and furious about uh, trying to get these out to planters. But um, we thank you and uh, I'll be around afterwards and later on to answer any questions or if there's any questions now. How much dirt should a row cleaner move? How much dirt do you want to move? I don't want it to move any. I want your opinion on that. <laughs> you could make it float like a feather, or you could make it like a chisel board. You could move enough dirt to cause trenching two to three inches deep. Depends on how you have your stops set in it. But you also could move it off that it barely would <coughs> spin on top of the ground. Um, no tail conditions, no problem putting a little extra downforce on there, breaking that crust and providing a clear path for your student units. Saw so some of those pictures look like coarse threaded bolts on there. Should there be a coarse threaded bolt in a in a row unit like that, or should we be looking at fine threaded bolts so they hold better? On the row cleaners? Well on the uh, on the uh, parallel linkage itself. Yeah, most of it's due from time and just wear and tear of all the bouncing up and down and just get worn out. So. Um, you talked about that compaction because of the central fill thing. I think Kinsey has weight distribution on theirs. Do they, is that better? Did they say anything about that? It is far better than what the meter system has out. They've done a very good job. They basically use hydraulics, right, to push it out to their yeah. ends. And that does help tremendously. Um, the problem, it does a very good job if it's just seed on that main tube, but anytime you start adding fertilizer tanks and stuff like that, there just gets to be so much weight after a while. But I would say that Kinsey does, I don't know how to measure it, but a, a whole lot better job at fish doing that weight than what deer does. Right. So. Blue is my favorite color planner, so it's. <laughs> I don't hide that from anybody who I worked with, they probably know that. So, um. Brent, with that um, hydraulic downforce on the um, planter units, you have those little weigh bars every single row, then, right? Correct. Have, I mean, we run though, a number of those on our planter, and they're not known to last <laughs> unless we're getting a pinch or something. But um, You are very correct. They have made their durability, their durability has increased in the last, in the last couple of years. Okay. Earlier models, especially, I don't know the last time, if you got any new ones in the last year or two or not. I think we get them regular. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's a common problem. Um, it's something that we face. The weigh bars do get dirt in them. They do get, they got wires moving around that are exposed on the top of that cot where the gauge moves. The system is designed if a weigh pin goes out, It'll take the average, let's say row four goes out, it'll take the average of row three and row five and apply that to row four. So you can't run yet with a weight pen. The weight pen durability is an issue. Right. And we wish as dealers it would get better. So that's most of our service calls um, in the spring as far as problems. <coughs> 